All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back. I hope you are doing well today. Do you have your coffee by your side? I hope so. Can everybody see me? Can everybody hear me well today? Are we ready to start? Good morning, everyone. Yes, Professor, you're crystal clear. Your voice is very clear and you're looking as fresh as it was yesterday. Thank you very much. <laughs> you're flattering me. <laughs> and my voice is crystal clear because, and I, I don't know if you guys um, give a lot of online lessons, but if you do, I strongly advise you to purchase one of these mics because oh. it, does, it does make a, a, a big difference. Uh, and it's just more comfortable for your audience if your voice is clear. So if you give online lessons or if you, yeah, or if you have a lot of online meetings or anything like that, then it's a good investment. Uh, Rajendra, you can't hear me. Apparently, everybody, no sound. No sound. You guys can hear me, right? Yeah, yeah, Professor, your voice is very clear. Yeah, okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So, yep. <laughs> Should I buy a new mic, Anton? <laughs> Second mic. Just like those politicians who sometimes have three or five mics in front of them. Very impressive. <laughs> For you, Anton, yeah. <laughs> Good idea. All right. Um, so uh, the recording of yesterday's workshop has been uh, uploaded on the website. Uh, the, the issue we encountered at the beginning with the blurry PPT has been fixed. So if you watch the video recording, it's going to be clear. Uh, and of course, all the all supporting documents are also available for you to uh, download. Uh, download them. Just go to the resource resources page and you will have access to all of these documents. Okay, so let's have a look at what we have to what we have to do today. So remember that yesterday we were supposed to talk about the most common mistakes and how to avoid them. So this is uh, what we are going to start with um, today. And this is this for this part, I really count on your participation. I'm just going to, uh, to, to start this session by uh, giving you an example of what type of uh, a document you can provide to your students. And then I will give you some time to think or to make a list of very common mistakes that uh, your students make when writing an essay and to provide a solution. Uh, so that's really going to be something we have to, uh, to, 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 to work on together this morning. And then we will just resume with the uh, standard agenda. So the second, uh, second session today will be on how to make a point, how to write a proper paragraph, essentially, how to make an argument. And this is something I, I think Peter yesterday already talked about it. Uh, I think Peter told us about his uh, peel method point explain, uh, analyze, link, and evaluate. So we're going to do something a bit similar uh, today, how to structure what are the essential ingredients or the, the, the important components of an argument. And, uh, and then we'll have, you see, there are many other uh, topics we need to discuss today. Um, I'm not sure whether we will have the time to do uh, everything. And again, it doesn't really matter. We will take the time that we need to do everything uh, properly. But each of these uh, topics are relatively short. Uh, so of course, the time we will allocate to each of them will depend on how much uh, discussions uh, we have. So eventually, this will depend on your um, level of engagement. Okay, so that's essentially the plan for uh, for today. Uh, does anybody have any question or anything to say before we get started? Are we ready? Okay. okay, so let's get started and let's talk about the most um, common mistakes and how to avoid them. So 
first thing I want to share with you is um, a memory that I have from uh, middle school. I think I was probably in grade uh, eight or nine, something like that. And, and, and I was taking English lessons and I had uh, a, an amazing English teacher and, and she did something that for me at least was extremely useful. She uh, asked us to have uh, a notebook in which we would write all uh, of our mistakes. So every time we took a test, uh, our job was to uh, list all of our new mistakes, of course, mistakes that were not already uh, written in that notebook. And uh, besides each mistake, uh, the could be the proper spelling or how to fix it, what we had to do in the future to avoid making that mistake again. So then each student had uh, a notebook with the mistakes that were made in the past. And then at the begin before each uh, test, uh, our uh, job was to review this particular notebook to focus on our mistakes. And at least uh, personally, I found it extremely useful. Uh, and this was a very effective way to correct my mistakes and making sure that I was not replicating the same mistakes over and over again. So I don't know if uh, any of you is doing uh, something like that with your students, but uh, at least it, from my experience, it is something that is extremely useful because it really encourages your students or it gives them the opportunity to uh, focus on their mistakes uh, and to make sure they don't do them again. All right. So. Um, but can we can we provide a bit more scaffolding for for our students because also something that i noticed is that um when we give feedback to 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 our students when they write an essay uh the feedback can sometimes be a bit overwhelming depending on how detailed it is and it might not be extremely practical uh because students don't really know they might not not know uh, what mistake is uh more serious than another and they might not necessarily know how to fix the mistake so um what i tried uh on a few occasions uh with my students and again this is something that was quite useful is at the end of each uh piece of homework as soon as they had to write an essay to uh, myself to compile a table where I would list their, the most common mistakes that they made, and then I would classify them. So I would classify uh, the mistakes on the basis of, is this a mistake that has to do with economics, or is it a mistake that has to do with writing skills? Okay, because it's, they are two possible kinds of mistakes when you think about it. So is it about the content or is, this, uh, is it about the, yeah, the, the way the essay is structured or poor writing skills? And then I've also classified mistakes by, by uh, how serious the mistake is. Because sometimes students, they make small mistakes and okay, something could be better, but it's not a big deal if uh, such a mistake is made. But on the other hand, some, some of the mistakes that are made are extremely serious and they would uh, uh, lead to uh, many points being lost. And again, it is important to classify uh, the mistakes by, by how severe they are, because you know that students, they tend to put everything on the same level. Uh, so if you, if you, when you give them feedback, if you identify 10 mistakes, it's going to be quite difficult for them to know, uh, okay, uh, what is the priority? What, what should I fix first? What should I focus on first? So for each mistake, is it a mistake that has to do with the content? Is it a mistake that is severe, that is mild? And probably the most important part, you must explain why it is a mistake. It's much easier for students to uh, fix a mistake if they understand why it is one. <laughs> If you just tell them, no, you should not do that, but if you don't provide an explanation, that's gonna be a bit difficult for them to uh, correct it. So classification and explanation, you should not do that because. And finally, 
you have the explanation, the classification, a solution. This is what you can do. This is what you should do next time to fix your mistake. So essentially, you have a table with uh, five columns. You have the type of mistake, content, or essay writing skills, the description, so essentially uh, what type of mistake was it, the severity, how bad is it, the explanation, why is it a mistake, and the solution. So let me just give you uh, one example with uh, three mistakes that I have, uh, three very common mistakes that I have um, identified. Uh, and then I'm, I'm going to give you five minutes uh, after that to try to find at least one. Or if you have more, uh, if you have more mistakes in mind, of course you can you can do more. But at least one mistake, and to uh, fill such a table uh, to classify uh, the, the the mistake, to identify how bad or mild it is, to explain why it is a problem, and to provide a solution. So let me show you an example. And then you will have to do it yourselves. All right, you should see my screen now. You should see this table. Okay, so you see, I have only uh, identified three uh, mistakes. Uh, on purpose, I have identified one mistake. So uh, one severity, one means it's a, it's a small mistake. Three, it's a big mistake. Uh, two, it's a so-so mistake. <laughs> it's a, not too serious, but uh, should be... Uh, it's important. Uh, the type of the mistake here, W means that it's really about the, the writing skills. So it doesn't have to do with the economics content itself. It's more like a proper writing practice. And E means economics. So it's really about, um, <clears throat> about the, uh, the, the content. So, okay. So then you have the description of the mistake, the explanation and the solution. All right, so let's have a look at each mistake one by one. Uh, to, 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 so, so you have an example of what I try to provide to my students. I'm going to be honest, I don't do it all the time, simply because it is quite time consuming, <laughs> of course, to do this. It is kind of time consuming, but it is extremely effective and rewarding. So, uh, okay, so we have a first mistake has to do with uh, writing practices. And, and that mistake is no definitions of acronyms. We use a lot of acronyms in economics, and sometimes students, they just uh, don't write the acronym in full text, it would be PPC, ATC, okay, anything like that. And to me, it is relatively serious. Why? Why is it a mistake? So that's the explanation part. It's a mistake because the examiner will not be able to assess your knowledge and understanding. Okay, that's the problem. The, the examiner does not know whether uh, students know the full meaning of the acronym. Okay, and also it's a mistake because acronyms, abbreviations, and notations, then they can vary from one source to the other. So perhaps your teacher uses an acronym that the examiner does not know. And of course, this is something that can, well, be a problem and that can make it difficult for the examiner to understand what you are talking about. All right, so what could be a solution? to use the list of commonly accepted acronyms, abbreviations, and definitions. I uh, wrote, where is it? Uh, but, but I think it's there. Yes, I, I, uh, I've put together this list. It's a long list, you see, of all possible acronyms with their well, meaning or definition. So students can use this uh, list. Uh, these are very commonly accepted uh, acronyms. So that's one solution, of course, that students can, uh, can, can use. And uh, of course, that's uh, usually what I tell them. Every time they use an acronym in their essay, they should write it in full text, okay? Not just PPC, but production possibility curve the first time, just to make sure that there is clarity, okay? So you see, that's to me a complete description and uh, assessment of the mistake and a solution is provided. Okay, uh, second one, uh, which also has to do with writing skills is when students, they repeat themselves. And you see, sometimes they are not very concise. They tend to say the same thing several times. It's a very severe issue. It's a big mistake. Why is it a big mistake? Well, of course, because it's a waste of time. If you say the same thing several times, then uh, you're going to uh, waste time and you will not have enough time to write about other things. 
So there is a big opportunity cost. And also because it just makes reading your essay very tedious, if you say the same thing several times. So that's something that can negatively affect your overall grade. So what is the solution to avoid uh, repetitions? Uh, simply to think before you write, <laughs> before you write a sentence, just ask yourself, okay, is this sentence adding value to my essay? I, am I uh, saying something new or am I uh, explaining things in a different way that does add value to my essay? If the answer is yes, then okay, go ahead with it. If the answer is, oh, I'm just uh, writing essentially what I already said before, of course, it's going to be redundant. You're going to waste time and it's not going to add value to your essay. Okay. All right. That's just one solution among many other possible solutions, of course. Last uh, mistake. So this one is a small one, severity one. It has to do with the content, economics, and it's a small mistake. So you have many students and sometimes even books that write the PED is elastic. Uh, it's a mistake because the PED is a number, okay? And a number cannot be elastic or inelastic. Doesn't make sense, right? A number can be high or a value can be high. It can be low. It can be positive. It can be negative, but it can't be elastic or inelastic. So it's very common. Uh, it's no big deal, of course, but it's better and it's easy to fix. It's better if students replace that by the demand is price elastic or the PD is high, something like that. Okay. Um, and let me show you another uh, another example. So this is something I did a long time ago. Uh, da, 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 da. Where is it? Uh, just give me a second. It should be here. Yeah, and then at the end of the day, well, of course, uh, the, the document I'm going to share is something I, I, I used to do a long time ago. So you see that the mistakes are not classified here. I did this a few years back, but... Uh, Essentially, what you can do is at the end of each each time they write an essay, or maybe not each time, but you can list the most common mistake. And what I did here, you see, I've already divided or classified the mistakes by uh, the mistakes. Well, first, uh, the mistakes that have to do with writing skills and next, the mistakes that have to do with the with economics itself. And for each paragraph, I identify the mistake and I uh, explain how to fix this. So it doesn't have the format of a table, but essentially the content here is uh, what I have already uh, described. Of course, you can download all of these uh, documents uh, on the website. Okay, so again, this type of table, I think it is extremely useful for students. So then they know uh, uh, what to focus on. They can focus on the most severe mistakes. They have a solution. They understand why it's a mistake. And uh, I've noticed that it really helps them to correct their mistakes from one piece of homework or from one test to the other. And yes, E means economics. All right. Um, <clears throat> does anybody want to uh, add something to share perhaps um, something you do with your students, something similar you do with your students to uh, help them identify their mistakes and correct their mistakes? Does anyone want to share with us before we move on? <clears throat> no? Hi, hi, Dr. Sylvain. Hello, Peter. Hi, um, yeah, hello. Um, yeah, thank you once again. Um, yeah, like you said, feedback is very, very important. Um, um, I think I'd do a similar thing to what you're doing, uh, only that I think you, 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 you're more detailed than I am. But um, every time we do a test or a piece of homework, um, I'll normally do custom made uh, mark schemes. As we all know, CIE mark schemes are not very useful. So uh, we'll do a custom made mark scheme and uh, put that as a PPT. And then I'll display it on the board. And after every question, I would have a segment on most 
common errors or most common mistakes related to this question. So when I'm marking the scripts, I'll be scribbling, I'll have a piece of paper next to every essay that I'm marking and I'll be writing down these mistakes, the most general ones and the most serious ones. So at the end of my marking, I have this list, a long list of most common errors made by students for every question. So after every question displayed, after every answer displayed on the, on, on the PPT, on the whiteboard in classroom, there will be a list of most common errors and students can identify with that. And I would be asking them who made this mistake and they'll be raising their hands and I'll be telling them the severity of these mistakes. And uh, as we progress through the year, the list of course will get smaller and smaller. So yeah, I concur with you that this is a very effective way of giving feedback. Um, and of course, annotating students' essays is also very important. But when a student see that it's not just them who are making these mistakes, and when they hear you say that it's a serious mistake, it's a severe mistake, then they take it seriously. So yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, yeah, I do the same thing. I have a piece of paper by my side when I mark uh, when I mark essays, just to uh, yeah make a list uh, to to make a list of the most common mistakes. Because obviously, individual feedback is very important. And later today, we'll have a dedicated session on how to give valuable feedback to the students. So of course, what we are talking about right now is a part of it. Uh, there are other techniques. Uh, but I also like to give uh, feedback in class, uh, just like what you mentioned, uh, collectively, just uh, so we can uh, all reflect together uh, um, on uh, the mistakes, but also on what they did well. Uh, it's, it's, it's also important to identify, because of course we focus on mistakes, <laughs> but uh, to maintain their confidence, I think it's also important to make a list of uh, what they improved. Uh, since last time, uh, just just because if we always focus on mistakes, because of course we want to fix them, uh, they might just um, lose confidence. And say, oh, but we we only focus on the what we did didn't do right, and perhaps they some of your students might feel like uh, you do not uh, recognize the efforts that they have uh, made uh, and uh, the progress that they have made. So I think uh, the the feedback we also give in in, in class can also be used to uh, share with them that uh, the, the improvement that you noticed uh, to balance a bit uh, the time that you spend uh, focusing on their on their mistakes. Uh, you mentioned that the mark schemes of Cambridge are, are not always uh, useful. Yes, I, I agree. Um, well, first, it, it, it's, it's difficult to write mark schemes for essays. Uh, for shorter questions, it is um, it, it is easy for, for data responses when you have a two mark or four mark uh, question. It's not very complicated to write a, a, a good mark scheme. But for 25 mark A2 essay question, for example, it's extremely difficult because uh, students could uh, essentially write, uh, well, the content included is difficult to uh, identify that could be relevant is difficult to identify. So it's not easy, but I do agree that the mark schemes used by Cambridge are, are not very detailed and they leave too much room for interpretation. So uh, maybe I should not say that, but I usually don't use them. <laughs> I usually don't use them, the mark schemes. Uh, I sometimes, sometimes when I'm a bit puzzled about an essay question, I sometimes uh, look at the mark scheme just to, to have a look at oh what is like the official uh, opinion <laughs> of this uh, of this essay question what did cambridge have in mind when um, writing this essay question what do they expect but i tend to uh, follow my own custom mark scheme as you as you said peter um, yeah what went well even better if absolutely peter anton you said i make sure i do this with students um, in the classroom from front of room example of student paper so they'd get used to it. Yeah, of course. As, as I remember what I mentioned yesterday that I, I think we learn uh, a lot uh, when we are provided with a lot of examples. Um, 
rather than being very theoretical. If you spend if you spend 10 minutes explaining to them uh, what is an analysis, what is an evaluation from a theoretical perspective, you may have some students who will find this useful, but overall, well, most of them, that's going to be a waste of time. On the other hand, as you said, Anton, if you just show them an example, say, hey, look, this is good. Why? Because you see that your classmate has done this and this and this. Oh, look, this could be better. What can we improve? This um, type of classroom conversation is likely to be way more effective. So yeah, examples, examples, examples. Um, yes, and you're right, Anton. Students don't look at the assessment objective section. Absolutely. Okay, Any? does anybody else want to share some practices uh, that you have implemented, successfully or not? Because sometimes it's also good to talk about uh, things we tried and that didn't work. <laughs> and I will tell you, uh, I will share with you some of my failed experiments uh, later, later today, because I, I try things. Sometimes it's successful, sometimes it's not, doesn't matter. Uh, we can share uh, both types of experience. Does anybody else want to share practices uh, on how to help students identify and correct their mistakes? Professor, I have a question. Yes, go ahead. That, uh, on your uh, this severity uh, scale, which is the column number three. So where do you rank the mistakes regarding the punctuation because most of the students like they don't capitalize the country names or the proper nouns so yeah is it okay we should ignore like safely uh, safely uh, uh, ignore or every time we should you know focus on asking them to make it right yeah. Well, I, I think whether or not to ignore also depends on is it easy to fix or not uh, if, if what what you mentioned the the example you used that sometimes students don't capitalize the uh, country names uh, that's rather easy to fix right to just tell them next time you capitalize a country names so I, I really don't think this should be ignored I don't think this is such a big deal so I would probably uh, uh, consider that this is a category one mistake. Uh, because again, uh, examiners on yeah. paper, they should not uh, subtract points uh, for, for students who do not capitalize country names. But uh, this could still have an influence, at least in the mindset, perhaps on the perception of the essay by the examiner. So maybe not, uh, this is maybe not something that on paper should uh, reduce or lower the grade of the student, but this might still have a negative influence on the, the examiner's perception of the student's work. So I don't think this is something that should be ignored, especially because it is extremely easy to fix. So punctuation, yeah, yeah. Uh, it depends because there are several types of punctuation mistakes. The one you mentioned, easy to fix, it's no big deal, but it's easy to fix. So I would definitely not ignore it. Does anybody else have a question or wants to add something before we start sharing about the most common mistakes? <clears throat> okay, so what we're going to do now, we are going to take uh, five minutes uh, for you to be uh, able to think of one mistake, at least one, okay? Five minutes should be definitely enough for at least one mistake <clears throat> that is very common. Could, it, it could be a mistake that has to do with the content that you deliver, the, the economics content. Could be a mistake that has to do with writing skills. Again, doesn't matter. Could be a severe mistake, could be a small detail, but still something that you believe that could be improved. And what I would like you to do is simply, you, you don't have to fill the table, but simply to describe the mistake, like the, the title of the mistake, if you want. The explanation, why is it a mistake? Why should we avoid making that mistake? Why 
is this something that can, at the end of the day, lower the grade of the student? And then to provide at least one solution, okay? And then after five minutes, I hope uh, we, we will take the, the time that, uh, that we need. And I hope that we can have at least 10 of you, we'll see, but who uh, will share this mistake with us so we can talk about it, okay? So right now it is 10.03, uh, let's say 10.04. So let's just, um, we will uh, resume uh, the, the session in five minutes so we can uh, start sharing about our findings okay see you guys in five minutes make sure you prepare at least one common mistake classification description explanation solution and we'll brainstorm in five minutes see you at 10.09 
Okay, two more minutes, everyone. Two minutes. Okay, it is 10.09. Let's just um, start uh, sharing uh, about those uh, most uh, common mistakes. So I'll start by uh, looking at what has been uh, shared in the, um, in the chat box. Uh, and then even if you have not posted anything in the chat box, if you have taken some notes, uh, you can simply uh, unmute your mic and, and share uh, share with us. All right. So I think who went first? I think um, Rajendra. I think you you went first. Would you Would you like to explain to us what um, uh, the the type of mistake that you um, that you have identified, and perhaps you can tell us a bit more about it? Hello. Yes. Yeah. Hello. So, yeah. Yeah, sometimes my students, uh, when I take their homework, uh, they have answered the question, but their sentences are meaningless. Uh, they have written essays, but meaningless sentence, or meaningless paragraph. Okay, sorry, this is not related to economics. This is a writing, okay? Writing is type. Uh, reading sentence, meaningless, so it gives different meanings, the paragraph. So I suggest them to rewrite the sentence or paragraph with the correct meaning or economic concept. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, of course, it is something that um, we uh, often face. Uh, mostly, you're right, it's not really, it doesn't really have to do with economics. It's mostly a writing skill, mostly because most of us, we have we are dealing with uh, students who are non-native uh, English speakers or English writers. Um, so they sometimes struggle. They sometimes struggle to uh, articulate uh, sentences that uh, make sense uh, and that are connected uh, to each other. Uh, what I, my, my solution, and perhaps uh, others, if you have other solutions to, uh, to, to, to help uh, correct that mistake, I simply tell them, uh, make short sentences, short and simple sentences. Uh, don't try using some uh, complicated forms or complicated structures. Um, you are not assessed as a student, you are not assessed on the quality of your English. You are, it's, it is an economics exam and it is much safer, especially for lower ability students to just write very short sentences. I often tell them, one sentence should say one thing. If you have one sentence in which there is too much content, uh, first, it's going to be very difficult to make sense out of this sentence when reading it. And second, it's more likely that at some stage, there is something that is not going to make sense as you, as you said. So that's my solution. Short and simple sentences. One sentence should say one thing. It's just one small step towards uh, where you are uh, heading when writing. Okay, <clears throat> good, thank you very much. Uh, we had, Anton, would you like to uh, tell us a bit more about uh, the mistake that you identified? I can say, uh, the microphone, I'm uh, cooperate. 
yeah, I think I need to get you a new microphone, Anton. <laughs> Definitely. I'll keep it short. Uh, uh, the problem here is students not really understanding the question well or taking the wrong words and the wrong assumptions from it. So I would even call this severity four because if you answer the wrong question, or I mean <laughs> the right question in a wrong way, uh, that costs a lot. So uh, it depends a bit what the cause is, whether it's English related and not understanding at all, whether it's economics related in that they only really remember one aspect of a topic like employment, because some students, if they just the word employment, they immediately think, oh yeah, I can write a perfectly competitive labor market and uh, monopsony and then show people losing their job and then I'm done. But of course, they miss the word uh, decrease in employment in the economy. They probably be looking somewhere else for the answer. So getting students to to identify what really is this about, what topic is this question about, is a, is a key skill, especially for the less English able students. And something I often practice in class, just asking students in short, what are, write down in short, before you take this as homework, what, is, what are the main things you probably will need to do, what you expect you need to do for this question, double check that before giving something as homework uh, and support them in that. Thank you, Anton. Uh, yeah, I, I think I, I agree with you that this should be a level four, level 10 uh, severity. And unfortunately, it's quite common, as, as, you, as, as you say. And I, I think they are, uh, there are two possible uh, two possible reasons. Uh, you mentioned one. Sometimes students don't answer the question simply because they don't understand it. Uh, they may not understand it because of uh, well English uh, weaknesses. Okay, that may be uh, uh, one reason. They may not understand it uh, because they have not really mastered the, the content and because they do not understand the, um, what content is being tested, because it's important that students, when they read the essay question, that they have an idea of uh, the, what type, what part of the syllabus, or what concepts within the syllabus are being tested and can be included in the, in the essay question. Uh, but to me, the, when, when students usually don't answer the question, it's simply because they lose track of what the question is when writing. Uh, because of course they don't have much time to write the essay question. So you know that many of them, they don't spend enough time planning. They read the essay question very quickly. They see unemployment and they start writing everything they know about unemployment without really thinking of whether it is relevant or not. Uh, perhaps because they assume that, hey, if I write everything that I know, well, how could how could I do better? Uh, but uh, the problem is that they just don't remember the, what the question is, and they simply write everything they know. And I agree with you that this is a, a, a very uh, severe mistake. Uh, how to fix it? So you mentioned it, more practice with, with the students. So this is a solution for you as a teacher. But a solution uh, for uh, students would be the planning, of course. The, that's prob there are several possible solutions, but to me, the, the, the most effective solution would be to uh, encourage students to plan their answer and to make sure when after they have finished planning that at the end of the day, once they will be finished writing their essay, that they have actually provided an answer to the question. What I sometimes do is that I um, give them the answer sheets only three or four minutes after I have uh, released the exam questions. Uh, so uh, for the first uh, four minutes, they have to choose what essay question to answer and they can only plan their answer. They can't start writing. That's one possibility. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Anton. Uh, who was next? Um, uh, Elva, 
Uh, can would you like to explain uh, the mistake to share that mistake with, with us? You say explanation of the uh, economics terminology, self-explanation of the economics terminology, severity one. Would you like to uh, explain to us what uh, what type yeah. of mistake this is? Thank you. Yes, uh, assume other teacher will share the most common one. So this is a very tiny one, but it occurs everywhere. Uh, for the terminology student like to use the same key term from that terminology to explain that. So uh, that is because they are still lack of the vocabulary and the solution I think is uh, ask a student to memorize the terminology in pair. So like uh, ask them to either memorize a pair of the uh, positive versus negative or a pair of the similar terminology. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> what, what would be your explanation of why this is a mistake? Uh, one reason is for the bilingual student, they are like of the uh, vocabulary. So they are like of some other uh, other words to explain, so they they can only use the keywords from that terminology, and then try to explain that, and they do not have any sense because they they do the translation sometimes. Yeah. So my solution is ask them not to memorize one single concept, but memorize pairs. So memorize the the. the one group of uh, positive versus negative or, or one group of uh, a similar terminology. So then they, during their memorization, they can even uh, try to manipulate the words to switch a couple of words for that group. Okay, so your idea is essentially to, um, to group uh, key concepts, the, the key concepts that are uh, that that are linked, that have things in um, in in common, uh, or simply because it makes it easier to uh, to switch from one to the other, or to 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 connect them in a logical way, perhaps. Yes, that's that's right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, Elva. Yes. Uh, so actually, yeah. this 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 sounds like a, a pretty big uh, issue, right? I would probably uh, even uh, uh, consider it a category two uh, mistake. Uh, all right, thank you very much, Elva. Uh, then we had uh, May who uh, told us. Okay, so the, I'll, I'll copy. Uh, I'll copy the information from the chat box. So for those who uh, watch the video recording, they will be able to to see that because I don't think they will have access to the to the to the to the chat box. Uh, severity four, okay, uh, explanation, okay, so I'm just copying, uh, May, would you like to explain to us uh, the type of mistake that you have uh, encountered, please? Hi, morning, can you hear me? Good morning. Yes, absolutely. All right, um, yes, this is a very common mistake, um, usually all our students, especially, uh, because English is not their native language, and they always make this mistake because they go is mixed up with this, like accept and accept. And uh, sometimes they get confused. Like even I had massage, you know, instead of message. I think this is very severe. So I always, always highlight that when my mark their homework or when I gave them, you know, their uh, answers back. And then I say, you have to pay attention to these words. And sometimes I will create also a solution like uh, accept and accept what's the difference in terms of the meaning. So they must always remember that this they have to avoid, especially when they go to exam to get it right, um, because they cannot tell the difference. Even the principal and principal, you know, P-A-L and P-L-E, remember your pal or remember your pearl, you know, something like that. So I think this is very common for all of us, especially when we are teaching students here in China. Thank you, May. Um, yeah, it, it, is, it is definitely uh, uh, something that, uh, that can be improved uh, in, in essay. I would not consider that a severity four uh, though, because uh, it is mostly uh, an English spelling mistakes. Um, it can be a big deal 
if it really undermines the 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 the, the, the ability to understand the essay uh, in that case yeah in that case it's 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 a problem but if you have uh, like the one you mentioned accept versus ex, ex, accept um, it depends of course but as long as you can understand uh, clearly what the student had in mind um, I, I don't think this is something that can have a big negative impact on the on the, on the final grade of course uh, this is i'm not saying that this is something that can be ignored or overlooked because as i mentioned earlier even if on paper students should not be penalized if they make uh, spelling mistakes uh, or grammar mistakes or things that really have to do with the um, english writing skills on paper they are not um, um, assessed on that the usually the the criterion is as long as we can understand it's fine, but um, it, it still it can still have a negative influence on the the, the examiner's perception of the student's work and uh, at the end of the day lead to a lower mark whether we like it or not whether we find it's fair or not this is just human psychology and we have to do with it so yeah it is it is serious and especially i think it's important that you mention it because it's not that hard to fix this type of mistake it's just a spelling mistake or uh, as i mentioned at the beginning of this uh, session today you can just ask students to uh, have a notebook where they would list this type of spelling mistakes um, and, and simply to, uh, to, to help them to correct them. Uh, spelling mistakes are a big deal if uh, a key economics concept is misspelled. For example, the one that you have probably all experienced in the past when students write economics of scale. Okay, uh, that is a big deal because it is a key concept and all key concepts should definitely be spelled properly. Uh, but uh, things that are not uh, key economics concepts, it is still a mistake. It should be fixed, um, but on paper, it should not have um, a very negative impact on the grade of students. Okay, thank you, May. Next, we have uh, Shweb. Uh, can, would you like to explain the mistake to us? Yeah. So it happened that at times uh, some student, you know, they uh, over bombard their answer with more and more uh, economic uh, jargons or economic terms without even thinking that it is related or not related with that point of discussion in the essay. So most of the time, even, you know, they have the demand curve, which is not the kinked demand curve, but they just include that, <laughs> that terms in there or sometimes they have they read some case study recently and without knowing that it is not related with that uh, thing in the essay, they just uh, like included it. So as we discussed yesterday, the, we should explain the solution is that uh, we should explain more and more to students that, you know, just uh, restrict yourself with, uh, with, the, with those terms which are just related with the answer and try to link, try to make a, uh, make a pr uh, proper bridge between your point of discussion in the essay and that term. For example, if they're uh, in an essay and they are discussing something which is related with dumping and they have used this term dumping. So without just, uh, you know, uh, instead of just writing this term, they should make a link proper with uh, what they are, uh, explaining about that issue yeah <laughs> thank you Shweb. uh yes uh just like what, what i said earlier sometimes students they feel like hey i just if, if i want to get a high grade the only thing that i have to do is to write everything i know uh <laughs> of course not um it, and you're right it is important that students um question how relevant is the content that they include uh, does it help what what they write does it help to answer the question is it useful and you're right if students they simply write uh, or include as many uh, terms or as many keywords as many concepts as possible hoping that this is going to pay off 
it, it, it's a big mistake. Uh, first, because uh, it's likely that most of the content is going to be irrelevant. Uh, so again, they are wasting time, including things, uh, content that is not relevant. And also because it is a very bad signal that is sent to the examiner. Essentially, what it means is uh, the student does not really know uh, what he or she is talking about. And to be, um, to be a bit rude, but essentially, if you, when you have this type of student, it's like the student is, is a bit bullshitting, you know, just trying to write everything, 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 without questioning how relevant it is. And when you read this type of essay, it's not very pleasant because you feel like, oh, so then I have to do the job. I have, as the examiner, I, am, I'm, I have to identify what is relevant and what is not. Uh, that's not my job. Uh, that's the student's job. So it's very unpleasant to grade this type of essay. Uh, it's likely that most of the relevant content is going to be overlooked because it has been replaced by irrelevant content. So yeah, uh, for usually this type of essay does not score uh, really well. And you're right, the solution is usually to plan. You plan, so during the planning part, you can uh, identify, you can think about is it relevant or not, just to focus on what really helps you to uh, provide a, a good answer to the essay question. Okay, thank you very much. What do we have? Uh, severity three. Yes. Okay. Uh, Angela, would you like to explain the um, to share the tell us a bit more about the mistake that you identified? Uh, uh, yes, this is a very very common uh, common mistakes uh, when I teach students. Students are uh, very very like to use. It depends, it depends. However, it depends on what, what. So usually uh, we cannot uh, make it very clear about what does it mean by it. <laughs> so uh, here's an example. Uh, I would like to share an example about a very simple example. Mm, the question is about the Philippine government was to increase welfare benefits. Uh, to the unemployed. So what would be the result of the unemployment rate in the Philippines? The students explain uh, some um, results. Uh, if the government could improve the welfare benefits, the uh, more people will stay in Philippines, less people go abroad to find jobs, uh, something like that. And then uh, when students want to give another um, uh, another opinion from different angle, uh, the students li like to use, however, it depends. So um, actually the students wants to say uh, whether, the, uh, whether there will be more people uh, going abroad uh, will depend on what what. <clears throat> so I think um, this is not a very severe mistake, but when examiner read the paragraph, I think it's uh, just like you said, it seems like the, it is the examiner's job to figure out the logic of students thinking. Mm. So I think it's a, um, not very severe mistakes, but usually I ask students to replace it with uh, more accurate words. Uh, for example, uh, the result of the policy uh, whether there will be more people going abroad or not, something like that, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Angela. Uh, and yeah, I, I completely agree with you. It's, uh, and I think it's a big problem, actually. I think it's a big problem because uh, if there, I think we call that pronoun reference. If there is not clear pronoun reference, if, if you have an it, but you do not know what it refers to, uh, that makes the sentence very difficult to understand. That makes the sentence very ambiguous. Uh, and that's often the case with long sentences, especially with long sentences. And that's why I ask students to write short sentences. And then, as you said, as an examiner, or as a, when you mark the essay, you have to guess, right? And we should not have to guess. Everything should be as clear as possible. And the, the examiners, they should not give the benefit of the doubt. So if you have an examiner that is, uh, let's say, relatively uh, lenient and uh, in, in a good mood, 
And then, okay, perhaps the examiner is going to assume that, okay, it refers to this and therefore it makes sense. But uh, it really makes reading, scoring, marking much more difficult and tedious. So yes, when, whenever pronouns are used, it, there should not be any ambiguity. It should be very clear what they refer to. And I agree with you, Angela, for, for example, if we use it depends, okay, uh, in, instead we should use the essay question whether or not uh, fiscal policy is blah, 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 depends on. So, so that's one way to get back to the question to, um, to refer to the question in a very clear and explicit way. So yeah, it's a very common mistake, I agree. And I think it's actually a, a big deal. So I would even classify it a category two um, mistake. Thank you, Angela. Uh, but, 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 okay, is that uh, is that it? Okay, would, would would anyone like to share additional mistakes that you have identified, even though you have not typed anything in the chat box? Would you like to uh, perhaps just unmute your mic and share some uh, uh, very common mistakes that you have uh, identified, explanation and and solutions. We still have time to do a few more. So if you if you um, would like to share mistakes you identify, feel free to do so right now. <clears throat> okay, okay then. Uh, again, the purpose of this is just to show you how you can use this type of table and I I realized that this might be a bit time consuming to do that after every essay after every piece of homework but at least from time to time I really believe that it is um, very uh, useful for your students it provides them with a clear uh, a presentation of the main things that can be fixed with a solution and uh, from my experience it has proven very uh, useful to help them correct their mistakes. Okay, so if there are no more uh, mistakes to be shared, let's move on. Let's move on and let's talk about how to make a point. Let's do that, how to make a point. Let me share the new PPT, how to make a point. And then you'll see, I will give you a lot of examples uh, that should help you to uh, that you can use with your with your students as well. Okay, you should see my PPT now. Okay, so how to make a point? Uh, there are several methods. Uh, and yesterday, uh, Peter shared with us the Peel uh, method, which is uh, very common when writing academic uh, essays. Um, the, however, it's students who take economics they are not exactly expected to write an academic essay <laughs> it's a bit weird to say that but you know that for example an academic essay will start with an introduction you will uh, uh, tell what your uh, thesis statement is um, we don't really do that. Uh, we don't really do that when writing uh, a level uh, economics essay so that's why I I tried when, when I'm going to explain how to make a point uh, in, during today's workshop, I, I have chosen a method that is suitable for our economics uh, students, something that they can really use. Um, and that's going to be uh, the most effective method, at least from, from my perspective, to make a point. And what I use is the C method, the C method. And it's very similar to what uh, Peter uh, said yesterday, I'm just removing some, some parts, renaming others. So when we make a point, when we write an argument, of course, the first thing that we should uh, do is to state it. So that's what Peter said, a point. Okay, point or state, it's essentially the same thing. So a point has to be stated first. It's like the title. Okay, it's like the title of your argument. What is the key idea that you are about to present? And of course, the, the statement part must be very clear, okay, and very 
succinct, like very short. Should be just one sentence. It is a sentence that just introduces my paragraph, that introduces my point, and that basically say, okay, that's the idea that I'm going to uh, develop. That's what I want to, to say. And it's very useful because it gives some context and it gets your reader ready uh, to uh, listen to your, to read your explanations and to go deeper into your arguments. That's the first st stage. I'm gonna provide you with plenty of examples. So the statement part. Once you have uh, stated uh, your point, once you have the title of your point, it's time to elaborate or to explain, okay? You explain your point. So this is the part, and that's why I wrote A-N at the end. This is the analysis part, okay? You have stated your point, no analysis. You have simply identified one idea. Now it's time to explain it using clear, coherent, and in-depth economic analysis, okay? So this is where you will connect the different economics concepts, terminology, to um, explain or to analyze the idea that you have previously identified. Okay. And finally, once you have explained your uh, ID, once you have analyzed uh, the, uh, the, your, your, your point, it's time to exemplify. So you can replace by illustrate, okay? You have provided the elaboration, the explanation tends to be rather general, okay? Theoretical. Often, not always, but often it is useful to use an example, okay? So after you have provided your general explanation, be more specific to illustrate it. Why? As I explained yesterday, because it helps to understand. It's always easier to understand something specific than something general, okay? So it's time to use examples, could be written numer numerical example to support the analysis. They are just there to make it easier to understand, to make sense out of the uh, explanation, out of the analysis. And I wrote AP uh, at the end because that's the application part. Okay. Uh, C, that's easy to remember. Okay. Uh, and these are essentially the three uh, components of uh, a point, of an argument. Okay everything that should be included in an argument. Uh, of course, as I said, examples should only be used if they are useful, of course. Sometimes there are some arguments that you make. It's not extremely useful to add an example, often because your, your point is really straightforward. So adding an example would not add much value. It would simply be a waste of time. So again, the last stage, is exemplify is often important. It is often necessary because it will add value, but students should consider whether including an example is going to be useful, whether it is going to make a difference. And of course, uh, diagrams can be used when uh, making a point and we will have a dedicated session uh, later. Uh, diagrams are not always used to exemplify. Sometimes they are, can be used to support the explanation, okay? Uh, for example, if you have a diagram about negative, sorry, if you want to write a point about negative externalities, you will explain that, okay, when we have a negative externality, we have an, an over provision of the product, okay? You can uh, use a diagram. In that case, it's going to support your explanation. Uh, or you can uh, use a diagram to illustrate something that you have uh, explained before. Okay, so as I said yesterday, if you have, if you explain what we mean by two goods that are in joint supply, uh, like, uh, okay, let's use the typical example like beef and leather, you, then you can use a side by side diagram with the market for beef, the market for leather. In this case, clearly your diagrams are there to exemplify. Okay, so remember, I really want to insist diagrams because it is a misconception. Diagrams are not always application. It depends. Is your diagram specific? Does it consider a specific case, a specific market, a specific type of good, a specific type of economic agent? Or is it general? If you have a general diagram about negative externalities, 
well, that's not going to be uh, an example. Of course not. It's going to be a part of the analysis, just going to be there to uh, illustrate your analysis or to uh, support your analysis. Okay. So essentially, that's how we should write a point. This is how we should structure. These are the ingredients. These are the key ingredients that should be included when, uh, when making a point. All right. So now um, let's use some examples. So this, this is the activity that um, I, I did when I was in, um, that I was in, in Hangzhou. So we, we, we were not going to do that. But what, uh, what I have done, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you. I have written several points uh, myself, and I have classified them. Uh, I think they are here. Yes, I have classified my points by uh, quality. Okay, you should you should see them now. Yes, uh, right. So I have written six examples. And there are three categories. So category one is, mm, I need more coffee. Uh, so that's essentially a, a, a point that is not very good. Uh, that could definitely be improved. Uh, yeah, the, the type of point that hurts when you read them. Um, category two, yeah, not bad, but there is still room for improvement. Okay, so I have two, two examples. And then uh, category three, Wow, that's what I'm talking about. So these are good points. All right. So these are not work from um, students. These are points that I wrote myself just uh, for the sake of example. Okay, so let's look at um, each point one after the other. And I would like you to tell me uh, what is good about this point, what you like about this point and what you think could be improved. Okay, all right. So let's let's have a look at point one. Point one: Married goods are overprovided in the free market. For example, too much junk food is being produced. All right. What do you like about this point? What do you think is good about it? And what do you think can be improved? Please tell me. Would be better if you would just. Uh, unmute your mic and, and, and share with everyone rather than using the chat box simply because it is much longer to type than to talk, right? So what do you like about this point? What do you think could be improved? I think... Uh... It is like not very good point. Uh, it needs a further explanation. Uh, it is just a statement, you know, that in a free market there, the just uh, over provision of merit good has been hinted and not just, you know, it needs further explanation. Okay, thank you very much. Does anybody want to add something about this point? Yes, Iman? I see you raised your hand. Would you like to share something with us? No? It would be much more uh, uh, productive if uh, everyone could participate uh, in in this otherwise it's going to be a bit uh, um, well not very engaging so please try to um, uh, participate so so we can move on together we can share we can uh, share opinions uh, on on this it will be much more entertaining than if it's just you, you can't talk, Iman. Uh, you should be able to try to, if you, you can just unmute your mic. If you just unmute your mic. Uh, okay. All right. The example is not relevant. Yes, well, of course, there is clearly a mistake here, right? Married goods are not overprovided. They are underprovided. So first we have a mistake uh, here. Um, and... Um, 
so there is that's that's the first uh, yes junk food is not a married good and married goods are not uh, over provided junk food is a demerit good uh the, the the big problem we have here is that there is no explanation whatsoever right uh okay we have a statement it's actually uh, wrong but it's a statement <laughs> we have uh an example but it's not even a good example because it doesn't explain why junk food is a merit or demerit good. Okay, again, the example is just a statement, but there is no nothing that justifies why junk food is or isn't a merit good. Uh, so it's, the example itself is not quite uh, relevant, not quite useful. But the biggest uh, problem here is that there is no explanation whatsoever. There is no diagram, there is no explanation why will merit good be overprovided? Even if it's wrong, right? It should be underprovided. There is no analysis at all. And again, the example is not sufficiently uh, elaborated. Uh, so that makes this overall point rather bad, very, very weak. Okay, let's look at point two. So point two, A2 syllabus. The liquidity trap. If the interest rate is close to zero, any further decrease in the interest rate will have no effect on the economy. For instance, if the interest rate is 0.5%, decreasing it to 0.25% will not change anything. All right. So in my opinion, this is not a good point. Why? What could be improved here? What could be improved? The first sentence, just a three word, the liquidity trap full stop. So first of all, you know, it is quite uh, misleading at least to explain something. And then this interest rate uh, thing, any further decrees will have no effect on the economy. So it is again, something problematic for me. <clears throat> okay, yes, I, I agree with you, Shweb. Of course, the, the first <clears throat> three words, liquidity trap, uh, sometimes students do that. And that's why I, uh, I, I use this example. Sometimes when they start their point, they, they don't make a full sentence. They just write the, the concept they want to talk about. Yeah, but they don't really make a statement. This is not a statement. Instead, we, we uh, the, a better uh, um, statement, would be, uh, besides, monetary policy can be ineffective, uh, especially expansionary monetary policy will be ineffective when the interest rate is very low. That's okay. That's a good statement. Um, that, that's definitely a, a better start. Yeah, I just want to add here, uh, instead of just uh, talking about, you know, as you rightly mentioned, uh, Dr. Ars, that, uh, you know, they could have uh, taught, uh, talk about the monetary policy, like instead of just directly going on interest rate. So on similar ground, you know, most of the time when students talk about taxes and the government expenditure. So it should be made a point that they can use the fiscal policy side as well, you know, using these terms, the fiscal policy, monetary policy in such questions or the essays, it adds value to the point. Yeah, you're right. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, it, 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 it's true, but of course, usually a point has to remain focused on one idea. And sometimes the points are not very uh, clear because students, they want to talk about too many things at the same time. And that makes it extremely difficult to understand what is the key idea. One argument is one idea and the explanation, the illustration should remain focused on that particular idea. Then of course you can have another argument or an evaluative comment about something else where you would mention other policies, for example. But one argument should definitely remain focused on one idea. Vanessa, you have unmuted your mic. Do you want to share something with us? Um, uh, I just found that uh, uh, examples not like not indeed uh, explained uh, his 
like illustrate his explanation. So just replace the words with uh, like a figure, 0 0.5%, 0 0.25%, yeah. It's not that very yeah. important. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And I, of course I did this on purpose. Uh, I think we can agree that this example is not very useful, <laughs> yeah? Uh, and, and that's what I said earlier. It's important to think about, all right, will my example add value? Is this interesting? Is this useful to add an example? And in that case, I think we all agree that this example is pretty much useless. Uh, it, it is useless because, yeah, it just replaced a, a low interest rate or uh, by uh, some figures and uh, will not change anything. It's, it's too vague. It's too broad. What does it mean? Will not change anything. And this is also something that uh, is too vague in the analysis. Uh, if the interest rate is close to zero, any further decrease in the interest rate will have no effect on the economy. What, what does it mean? You see that this is not a clear analysis. What it should say is that it's not going to stimulate investment. It's not going to stimulate consumer spending. It is not going to stimulate net exports. And therefore, it should be expected that aggregate demand is not going to increase much. Okay, this is much more precise. This is a much better economic analysis. It is the it provides an opportunity for students to use many more concepts and to connect them in a logical way, rather than saying something very vague, very unclear that have no effect on the economy or will not change anything. Okay, so yeah, that's often something that I write on my uh, students' uh, work. I, I write too vague. It's too vague. It's not precise enough. So that's, you see that there are many reasons for which this point is definitely not okay. It's not good. All right, let's have a look at the second category of uh, uh, points. So they should be better but not yet uh, perfect. Well, nothing is ever perfect, but not uh, well, some things could definitely be improved. So let's look at, let's have a look at point three. The demand for a product is likely to be price elastic if that product has many close substitutes. Indeed, a large number of substitutes makes it easier for buyers to switch to alternatives when a product becomes relatively more expensive. Okay, everyone, what do you like about this point and what do you think could be improved? Well, as a rule, uh, like it's fine, you know, the economic rule or just as a statement or the uh, from the textbook point of view, but uh, it has also one mistake that it is very generalized, you know, not every demand, not every product is, uh, uh, its demand is such like the perfect way of price elastic. So yeah, one thing it's like very finely uh, written, but the other side, you know, still improve point of improvement is that uh, not every product, you know, its demand is such uh, price elastic. Thank you. Let's just give me a second. The neighbors are doing some fireworks outside and I can't hear anything. Just give me five yeah. seconds. Okay, finally. <laughs> maybe maybe someone is marrying. Yeah. Uh, who knows? <laughs> who knows? Maybe someone is marrying. All right. I'm sorry, Shwe, but I haven't uh, heard anything you said. Can it's you, okay. Just, can you just it's repeat? okay. I can repeat. I can Wait, repeat. Just, just summarize. Just, just, just summarize what your key idea was. Yeah, so I was saying that, you know, as a generalized this statement from the textbook point of view, like it's fine, I like it, it's the way the, uh, uh, these two sen sentences have been constructed. But again, you know, the point which is missing that not every product, its demand is such a uh, price elastic. So the student should have, you know, mentioned, you know, the type of product he's dealing with or uh, talking about, but it's too generalized uh, statement, yeah. Okay, absolutely. It's too general. So what is missing? What would definitely add value to this point? 
I think the uh, product type or an example, for example, if uh, the, yeah, as the Angela is also mentioning, yeah. So uh, the example, for example, Pepsi uh, and Coca-Cola, maybe they have included uh, this example or any of the, you know, substitutes uh, they can, or in their <laughs> local context, they can be added, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So what's, what, what's missing here is clearly an example uh, the, is this so? Is this gonna add value? Yes, of course. In this case, it would be very useful to take a product that has many substitutes and to explain that. Yeah, all right. In that case, uh, it's very easy to switch from one brand to the other simply because there are many, many uh, substitutes. Uh, I usually uh, my, my students are usually uh, not allowed to use Pepsi and Cola <laughs> because it's too common. Uh, so instead, I, I usually tell them uh, different brands of toothpaste or some or something like that. Um, simply, again, as I said yesterday, it's important to use examples that are a bit more diverse examples that other students may not necessarily use. So yeah, you should also try to encourage them to, to find um, the other new examples, to find their own uh, example. Uh, so yeah, this point, uh, there is a very good statement. This statement is excellent. It's very precise. Uh, it's the a good title of my argument. And then we have a good explanation. Okay, we could argue that it could be written in, in a different way, that it could be improved. But overall, I think we would be very happy if our students could write this type of explanation, right? So I'm happy with this type of explanation. But you see that it would have been uh, very useful to add an example here to exemplify uh, this, uh, this analysis, this explanation. Yeah, so we could, we could give a specific type of product uh, and just to, uh, we could even use some uh, numbers, why not? But overall, I think you, you have all uh, identified what the problem is, no example here. Okay, let's have a look at point four. So I'm going to uh, catch my breath and read it because it's a single sentence, right? An increase in the money supply can be expected to bring about an improvement in the trade balance. Okay, sorry, that's uh, two sentences. Indeed, an increase in the money supply will lead to a decrease in the interest rate. So there will be a net outflow of hot money and the demand for the domestic currency will decrease while its supply will increase. So the country's currency will depreciate. <sighs> Making exports relatively more competitive and imports relatively less competitive. So assuming that the MLC is satisfied, the trade balance will move towards a surplus. <sighs> okay, what can be improved here? Let's go straight to what can be improved because I think it's fairly obvious. What can be improved? Yeah, 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 yeah. You see uh, that clearly the, 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 the explanation. Actually, when if you read the yeah. explanation, it makes yeah. total sense, right? The explanation is, is excellent. Uh, everything is connected in a very logical way. Um, there is even the Marshall learning condition, so it's a perfect uh, analysis. But clearly, you see that this sentence is very long. It's too long, yeah. and that makes it even even if the analysis is sound, even if it's correct, even if it makes total sense, it's just very hard to read. It would be much better to divide it into many shorter sentences. Okay, indeed, an increase in the money supply will lead to a decrease in this. Uh, interest rate. Therefore, there will be a net outflow of hot money and the demand for the domestic currency will decrease. Okay, we could even just uh, stop there. Uh, okay, just to, I'm, I'm not going to do it, but to cut the analysis, to split it into smaller parts that simply make it easier to, uh, to go uh, to follow the train of thought. Okay, otherwise it's extremely difficult to, uh, uh, to, to, to follow what the student had in mind and to follow 
the different stages or steps of the analysis. The statement is very good, okay? No problem, uh, it's, a, it's a good statement. The analysis is sound, but the way it is written is very heavy. It's very difficult to read. And you see that there are no examples. Should we add an example here? Do you think an example would be, uh, would be useful? And yes, the analysis could be more concise, I agree. Yeah. Should we yeah. add an example? example? Would it be useful? Yes. What, yeah, type of, here. What, what example would you use, Trey? For example, uh, uh, the student can in, uh, uh, include any uh, scenario from the Fed or the, you know, they can say about any central bank, whatever, you know, they are talking about. And in that scenario, they can, for example, if they can, if they are talking about uh, bank, like central bank of uh, China or the Fed, Federal Reserve. So at the same time, they can link it with the trade balance of the country. So instead of just generalizing it, that, you know, the uh, money supply uh, decrease or increase will impact the uh, trade surplus or trade deficit, they can just write that if the central bank of uh, uh, the XYZ uh, country decrease or increase the money value, it will affect the trade uh, surplus or deficit in such a way. Yeah, okay, make, so, make it more. All right, if, if, if the student is uh, familiar with the real world example of a central bank that has uh, increased the money supply, why not? But for, 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 for this particular argument, uh, I think it would be um, uh, examples are not necessarily useful in this case. The biggest problem in this uh, in this point is that yeah, the way the analysis is written is is very difficult to read. Uh, but yeah, a real world example could be useful, especially if the student knows some data about the the increase in the money supply in a country and uh, the movement of the the corresponding movement uh, in the trade balance. Um, but Overall, for this particular case, uh, I think we could do without an example uh, because I, I feel like most examples would not have much value in this particular case. So, but of course, it depends uh, on what type of example would be used, possibly. Do we need to explain uh, MLC? It depends. Uh, it depends on what the essay question um, is. It depends on whether MLC is something that is central to the uh, to the essay question or not. But you're you're right. It may have to be defined if it is something that is at the core of the essay question. Uh, if it is not at the core, we could add something like that when uh, the PD for uh, exports uh, plus uh, something like that. The PD for imports is greater than one. Okay, something like that. You could add a very brief uh, definition uh, simply to uh, send a signal to the examiner to say, hey, look, I know what this is. I know what this condition is. So, but again, it depends on how central this condition is in the essay question. <laughs> yeah, you're right, Angela. Every central bank is doing the same thing at the moment. So <laughs> uh, we would not know which central bank to choose, right? Absolutely. All right. So now let's move to the last uh, category of uh, examples. Uh, so I have two examples that are, uh, uh, I think, okay, I'm not saying that they are perfect. I'm sure that there are several things that we could improve. But uh, I think, again, we would be all very happy if our students... Uh, uh, could write, could make points like that. All right, so let's have a look at point five. Uh, economic growth is likely to cause environmental damage. Indeed, an increase in production usually requires the use of additional natural resources and therefore accelerate the depletion of non-renewable resources such as oil or natural gas. Besides, economic growth is often associated with higher greenhouse gases emissions which are responsible for climate change. For instance, the steady increase in the world beef production has been responsible for higher emissions of methane, a greenhouse gas more than 25 times as potent as carbon dioxide. Okay, that's pretty good, right? If you tell me that that's bad, I'm going to be very upset. So, <laughs> but <laughs> no, 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 I, I, I think it's, it's okay when, 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 we, yeah. when, we have, when we have something like that, when, when we have a point like this, we have a clear 
uh, statement. Yeah. Okay. Let, let me just highlight it. That's my statement. Then uh, we have the uh, analysis. So we actually, I have two different dimensions in my analysis. I have this one, uh, the fact that, okay, we use more natural resources and therefore we deplete natural resources. I have briefly added uh, examples, oil and natural gas. Then I have the second dimension of analysis or the second angle, if you want, the fact that greenhouse gases emissions. And then I have uh, an, an example here. So you see that I do have all the ingredients. I have my statement. I have an analysis divided into a, a two different angles. And then for each angle, I have uh, a few things to exemplify. A few things to exemplify what uh, I have just said, especially the second one. Uh, to me, when, when I see something like that, it, it feels complete, right? It feels that nothing has been um, overlooked and uh, a lot of skills have been uh, demonstrated. Uh, the, the skill to apply knowledge to specific case, the ability to connect different concepts in a coherent way. Okay, something like that makes me happy when I read it especially when my students write it, <laughs> not when I write it, of course. Uh, okay, would you like to add anything about this point? Is it okay? Uh, which, yeah, yeah. Fine. I'm okay with it. Yeah, it's perfect one. All right, last example, point six. It should be noted that the more price elastic demand relative to supply, the greater the tax incidence on producers. Okay, so that's my statement. In that case, indeed, producers cannot pass on much of the tax burden to consumers. Simply put, this is because the rise in the price paid by consumers is smaller than the fall in the price received by producers. So that's my, oops, sorry, I'm trying to highlight. This is my analysis. And then we have the uh, an example. Okay, all this with the comment. It's it's very long, of course. You, it's a very long example. Then the the rest is your example. The two side by side diagrams below illustrate this relationship. When the government imposes a seven dollar indirect tax on a good or service, so you have the side by side diagram. Okay, or you have the two possible cases. And then below your diagram, you have a comment. So of course, this point is particularly long. And I don't expect students to write points that are that long, but this is just an example, just to reinforce what should be the structure, okay? What should be the structure of a point, the statement, the explanation, and then if useful, if relevant, an example. So here, this is an example uh, that I, I use with, um, with, with diagram. With, and you see what makes it an example is that I have used figures, you see? And in my comment, I make the figures explicit. So I do consider a particular case. So that's why my diagrams can be considered to illustrate uh, or to, to apply my knowledge to a specific case, okay? So again, I think a point like that, if, if we had our students writing points like this, I think we would be pretty happy, right? <laughs> All of us, I think. Okay, uh, would you like to add anything about this particular point? Is it okay? Would, is there anything else? Let me zoom out a bit so we see everything. Okay, is there anything else you think uh, could be improved in this point? Mm. Price relative supply. Maybe tax incidents on consumer producer. Yeah. Uh, I would be more happy, more. Professor. Sorry to cut you. Mm -hmm. I would be more happy if they have indicated in the diagram the uh, the surplus or the producer consumer or producer surplus, like break like writing that this is consumer surplus or this is producer, yeah. Uh, this TIC, TIC, okay, okay. I think. Absolutely, I'm, I'm absolutely. So the tax incidence on producers, we should definitely add tip. 
and tax incidence on consumers. Do I, uh, I don't know if I, you, you're right that you see that in this case, I have TIC and TIP, but there is no definition of these acronyms before. Exactly, so, yeah, that's what my true, point is. Absolutely, yeah. that I should have added. Um, actually, the reason for which I did not do that is because I assumed that this was explained before in the essay. But you are absolutely right. We should have a clear definition of what is TIP tax incidence on producer and TIC tax incidence on um, consumers. Uh, but, 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 all right, I don't really have it here, but absolutely this would be important to make it clear. Okay, very well. So now let's look at um, more examples, but now it's a bit different because the examples, they are not classified by quality. So that's your job to read each point and to tell me whether you would consider that this is a, uh, let's say, a, a poor essay, a, a poor uh, point, an okay uh, point, or a very good point. So let, let's say that if it's a, a, a bad argument, if you think it's not very good, you can simply type one in the chat box. If you think it's an average point, you can type two in the chat box. And if you think it's a very good point, you can type three in the chat box. So let me share. Uh, okay, you should see my, yeah. Do you see my new points? Yes, there are six new points. And again, just uh, if you think it's, it's not good, you type one in the chat box. If it's average, you type two in the chat box. And if you think it's good, you type, very good, you type three in the chat box. So let's focus on point one. I'll give you 30 seconds to read it. And then you type one, two or three in the chat box to uh, let us know what you think about this point. Is this bad, average or good? 30 seconds. One, two, or three. Okay, so for now we have only uh, twos, so average. One, so not good, two, statement is not completed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's say that on average, we have maybe 1.8, <laughs> something like that. Okay, among those who said one, so uh, Mabel uh, and yeah, Mabel. You voted twice, <laughs> okay. Uh, would you would you like to tell us uh, what you the reason for which you think this point is bad? This argument does not meet the standards, and what could be improved? Would you like to share with us? Your computer does not cooperate. Make it cooperate. Be be tough. <laughs> it's fine. Kidding. Um, all right, who would, like, who would like to tell us why you think this point is not amazing? What, what could be improved? It's again, very, very generalizing. So very uh, general uh, statement. Yeah, because maximum prices uh, can encourage, you know, and then the wording is also not so uh, st standard. So the W issue as well. Yeah. And the example, I'm not okay with the example, actually. Yeah. Well, yeah, this again, this example is not quite useful 
so obviously, uh, this is an attempt to use an example because you see that the student is using, well, I wrote it again, of course, but let's pretend it's a student. The student is, is trying to use a particular product, so bread, but you see that this example is just a repetition of what has been said before, just by replacing essentially product by bread, <laughs> okay? Uh, so is this really the purpose of an example or just to replace a, a general term by a specific term? Not really. So you see that the, the, uh, the purpose of uh, illustrating uh, your argument is, has not really been met. Um, Something that is uh, not good with this uh, point is that there is no clear statement, or at least the statement could be a, a single sentence, okay? The statement, okay, could be there, but then we should have a new sentence to explain, okay? We should separate the statement from the explanation. They should not be in the same sentence okay maximum prices can encourage illegal transactions okay it's a statement this is because they create a shortage so i didn't define shortage here because again i assumed it was defined earlier in the essay but if shortage was not defined uh, before it would definitely require a definition okay and so buyers have an incentive to offer a higher price to get the product it is correct uh, but the big problem here is that, yes, this example is not quite useful. It would, be, uh, it, it would be useful to give an example, but something that would actually illustrate the argument and that support the explanation that was given before. Also, you see that perhaps we could have used a diagram. Again, it depends on whether uh, a, a diagram was already used before, okay? Yeah. But assuming no diagram was used before, it would have been very useful to use one at that stage. So yeah, uh, I agree. I don't think it's great. Um, I would have given maybe, yeah, maybe two and then two or 1.5 okay, out of three, because yes, the, the statement is not bad. The explanation is not bad, but there is no, the example is quite poor. There is no diagram and perhaps no definition of shortage if uh if this key term had not been defined before okay point two same thing i give you 30 seconds to read uh point two and uh, just type in the chat box one two three depending on whether you consider that this is um, a, a good point or not 30 seconds one, two, or three for this point on means-tested benefit. Please vote. What do you think about it? Is it a bad a bad argument? Is this an average argument? Do you think it's good? Is there anything we can do to improve it? One, I think, two, uh, or three? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think it's an average uh, statement. And the reason, and the reason of me saying that it's, it's an average uh, uh, statement that it is just a very, uh, again, very generalized mean tested benefits are only received by low income households so you know all of a sudden it uh, talks about the the disposable in, uh, income inequalities yeah so just jumping from one uh, thing to the other yeah 
So here it's a sort, it can be improved further. Okay, does anybody else uh, would like to share your opinion about this point on means tested benefit? Well, we have a, a clear statement, okay? No problem. Means tested benefits can be used to reduce income inequality. Definitely, very clear. Then we have uh, indeed means tested benefits are only received by low income households. And so disposable income inequalities are lower than gross of income inequalities. It's a pretty good explanation. Okay, the analysis is sound. Do you think the vice versa here is relevant? Is this appropriate to use vice versa here in this particular context? No, 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 of no, course it is not. not necessarily uh, true. Yeah. No, the reverse is. Not yeah, I, I, I added this because sometimes students, they feel like, hey, I'm going to use vice versa because it looks fancy, right? Or I'm going to use a Latin um, uh, a phrase. It's going to sound amazing. Uh, but sometimes they don't know how to use it properly. I even had students who use vice versa at the beginning of the sentence. Uh, it's so, yeah, okay, it's fine. And it's actually a good idea to use uh, and vice versa to avoid repeating yourself, to avoid writing two sentences. But uh, students should make sure that they use this uh, Latin phrase, which means, yeah, and the opposite is true in, in, a, in an appropriate way. Okay, they are not too sure on how to use it. They, they, they should not include it in their essay. And uh, would you think, would you say that it would be interesting to use an example here? Would it be useful to add an example? Would an example add value to this point? I don't think so. No. Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so here. But it depends. What do you say? Well, I think it would be useful. Uh, okay. Just to give one example of means-tested benefits, okay? Because there are plenty of means-tested benefits. It will, I feel like it would be uh, useful to, uh, to, 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 to give an example. Let me show you. Um, uh, I have, uh, if you look at my AS uh, PP, uh, yeah, my AS PPTs should also be in my A2 PPTs, but it's, if you look at my AS PPTs, you should find a table. Yes, and let me share it. Uh, bu, bu, bu. Yeah, you should find a table where I have uh, listed the benefits uh, in the UK. Uh, so in cash, so monetary benefits and in kind, so non-monetary benefits in the UK. And I have divided them into like two columns, universal benefits and means tested benefits. So yeah, uh, uh, students are very welcome to use uh, examples of means tested benefit. Um, so of course they should know what they are. So it would be interesting for them. And there is a, a very good web page that I have shared uh, during my workshop covering this part of the syllabus where all of these uh, benefits uh, that are given in the UK, that exist in the UK, are explained. So students should know at least at least one of each type and then to, to, to uh, support the, uh, this, this point, I feel like it would be useful to use one example of means tested benefit just to a signal to the examiner, hey, I know uh, what uh, means tested benefit exists in the UK and how they can reduce the income inequality. So I would use an example. I would use an example of a means tested benefit well, in the UK, if possible. I think, I believe it would add value to this point. So I would, yes, I would say it's a category two point because there is a good statement there is a good explanation even though the, the vice versa doesn't make sense at the end 
And I think an example would have added value to this point. Okay, let's have a look at point number three. So same thing, I give you 30 seconds to read this point and tell me what you think about it. Same thing, please vote one, two, or three in the chat box, one for a bad point, two for an average point, and three for a good point. 30 seconds should be enough for one minute. This one is a bit longer. Tell me what you think about it. One, two, or three. So we have one, three, okay, three. Two threes. Do you need more time to read it? Okay, the third three. All right, so for this one, I think we all agree that this paragraph is very good. Okay, it's a very good paragraph. We have a clear statement, okay, despite a much stronger market power, a monopolist may charge a lower price than a perfectly competitive firm. That's my statement. And then we have a very detailed, maybe overly detailed, but at least it's very clear. Again, this is just for the sake of example explanation okay i'm not going to read it uh, again uh, you have here a key concept economies of scale with a definition because it is a key concept and of course it deserves to be defined uh and okay and then it, it really explains why yes a monopolist it connects it to Say, okay, the level of output is large, therefore it can take uh, advantage of economies of scale, and therefore we have a lower cost of production and eventually lower price for consumers. So the analysis is actually uh, very good, so no problem. Then we have this diagram, but there is a, a, a big problem with this diagram. The big problem is that there is no explanation at all. And it's quite common that students, they will simply include a diagram, which may be absolutely relevant. And actually this one could be perfectly relevant, but you need to explain what the diagram shows. Why is it relevant? How can you use this diagram to uh, illustrate or support your explanation? And this one, I actually uh, took this diagram from one of my PPT. And yeah, this is the diagram that I use to explain why uh, it might be more cost efficient to have just one firm producing the entire uh, industry output than many small businesses, okay? To show that the cost function is sub-additive if, uh, if you look at my PPT. So yeah, this diagram, is actually perfectly relevant, but the issue is that there is no explanation of how we should read this diagram. Okay, there is no uh, nothing to guide the reader and to explain why this diagram is relevant to the uh, question. So uh, yeah, I think yeah, I would give two, not three because here uh, there is a, a diagram which is oh, 2.5, okay. But this diagram would 
definitely deserve to be explained. Otherwise, it doesn't have much value. I often write besides my student's diagram, no comment equals no value. And it's often true. A diagram that is not, that doesn't have a comment, uh, doesn't have much value, especially if it is a complex diagram. If it is something very easy to understand, okay, you can do without a comment, but something like that would definitely deserve to um, be uh, commented. Okay, so very good statement, very good analysis. It's a relevant diagram, but that lacks an explanation. Okay, point four. Well, this one is much shorter, so I'm going to give you 15 seconds. <laughs> what do you think of point four? The PPC will increase when more goods are produced because there are more resources like workers and factories or because R&D. One, two, or three. Not so good, not so good, Professor. The production possibility curve. It's a, a very short uh, argument, and there are so many things wrong. <laughs> yes, so many things wrong in this single sentence. Number one, okay, the PPC. Uh, there is no definition of the acronym. Okay, perhaps it was given before. Okay. We don't really say the PPC will increase. We should say it will shift outward, right? So it's like not a very good use of the terminology. We should not use increase. More goods are produced. No, it's wrong. It's when we are capable of producing more goods. We don't know whether we will actually produce more goods. Okay, we have the potential to produce more goods because there are more resources. Yes. Okay, so that's one possible uh, factor. But it, what is it? Is it a statement? Is this is this an, an analysis? Not so clear. Like workers and factory. Okay, we have an attempt to use an example. Why not? Or because R and D. Again, uh, it should be better to explain what R&D is, or at least to write that this means research and, and development. But you see that there is no explanation whatsoever. Why does R&D, research and development, can make the PPC shift? There is no diagram. So you see that there are so many things missing, and we don't really know what the point is what what is the student trying to say here uh, so that makes it a very weak point they are there is no clear explanation uh, the examples that are used are just uh, statements are just stated they do not uh, support any explanation in a relevant way. So yes, I think we all agree that this is not what we expect from our students. So yes, I would definitely give one to this, to this point. Very, very weak. Point five. Okay, I'll give you one minute to read this point and tell me what you think about it, about protectionism, point five. One for bad point, two for average, and three for Pretty good. What do you think? Three, we have two threes. Okay. I'll give you a few more seconds to read it and tell me what you think about it. Three, okay. All right. <clears throat> yeah, uh, this one is pretty good. All right. So However, trade protectionism can also be harmful to domestic firms. I started by however, because we, I assume that 
before uh, the previous point explained that trade protectionism can protect, of course, domestic firms and, and be beneficial to them. But it's also important to recognize that some of them can be harmed by trade protectionism. Then I explain, okay, firms sourcing raw materials from other countries will experience an increase in their cost of production. This is because trade protectionism will bring about an increase in the price of these imported resources. Okay, so we have the explanation here. And then after the explanation, I have one example, one illustration here. For instance, if Japan introduces a tariff on Chinese steel, then Japanese car companies may lose competitiveness because they might end up sourcing local steel at a higher cost. So you see that the key ingredients are there, the statement, the explanation, the uh, illustration. Um, I did not include a diagram because of course you know that there is a diagram for tariffs because again, I assume that this diagram was uh, introduced before in the essay. It's likely that it was introduced before. So that's why I did not include it. But yeah, you see that this is a point that is clear concise and that demonstrate uh, all important skills so yeah i agree i would give three to this uh, to this argument and finally let's have a look at point six what do you think about this one the last one It's not a very good statement. Actually, it's a bad one. Uh, specifically, uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Yeah, yeah. So if they, uh, from that they did in the past, so it, you know, it could have written, you know, from their past occupation, there are writing issues and then there is an economics, economics issue. Yeah. So its construction is also bad and it doesn't make any sense, especially the example if you see there. All right, this is not a very good point. I think we, uh, I think we agree. First, uh, you see that the state, there is no clear statement. I think Angela said, what's the point? All right, so uh, the point a better, um, a better statement would be something like, uh, yeah, structural, because we are when we talk about this type of unemployment, we talk about structural unemployment uh, can be uh, reduced if the government retrains uh, unemployed workers. All right, something like that. Okay, that would be a much better uh, a better uh, statement or something like occupational mobility can be increased if the government provides uh, training to the unemployed to the unemployed something like that okay uh, but it's always important that uh, your the the argument the point starts with a clear statement that tells us all right this is what i want to say and you see that here the government can retrain unemployed people so they can have more skills and find on the job that are different from what they did in the past uh, okay but you see here that there is another mistake is that clearly there was a, a key, key concept, occupational mobility that was not uh, mentioned or structural unemployment that is clearly something else that should have been mentioned and there is no mention of it. So in terms of knowledge and understanding, uh, it's quite poor, definitely. 
Uh, the explanation is uh, rather, so the statement is not clear. The explanation is not so clear. Okay, say, so, okay, they, if you have more skills, but then we should definitely say that because workers have more skills, they become more occupationally mobile and therefore they can apply for more jobs and increase their chances to, 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 to find a job essentially. Uh, okay. Um, this, then you see that there is something in, in the middle, this will cost money, but at least the government will not have to pay unemployment benefits. Uh, this is something that is relevant. It is quite interesting, but that should come later, perhaps as an evaluative comment. Why not? Okay, you could, you could, it would be interesting to balance the benefit of reducing unemployment against the cost of retraining workers. So it sounds like, okay, this, is, this would be an interesting thing to discuss, but later, again, a point should remain focused on one idea. So I would actually move this later on as an evaluative comment. So we could have here an example. So this is the example. Okay. So here, I don't even know what color to use because it's a mixture of a statement of an unclear statement and an unclear explanation. So I'm not going to use any color. But here you see the example. If John has always worked, I, I use this example because one of my students always likes to do that. He always talks about John. I don't know why. If John, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I told him several times, but he, he keeps using John as his, uh, he, the hero of his uh, essays. If John has always worked as a cashier, he could learn new skills and do something else. Okay, but again, you see that this example is just a repetition of uh, what has been done before. So it's not the purpose of using examples have, has not really been used here. It's not a good uh, illustration of how uh, retraining workers can reduce unemployment. Not, not really. Uh, it's a good attempt, but it's not a successful attempt. So you see that there are yeah many things that are not that are a bit awkward. I find that this point is just awkward because you can tell that there is, you can tell that the student understands the idea but really fails to uh, explain it clearly and to demonstrate the skills uh, in a clear way. There is no keyword. The explanation is very superficial. The statement is unclear and the example is not extremely relevant and not very useful. So yeah, I would give a one, maybe 1 1.5 if I'm in a good mood, but it's definitely not a good point. So as I told you yesterday, I, I think it's important to provide as many examples as possible to our students, examples of good practices, examples of bad practices, just to help them understand how they should write and how they can use their, uh, how they can improve their work. So you can use examples from their uh, essays directly, or you can just make up your own example, just like I did this morning. It just took me a few minutes to come up with uh, six uh, examples of good and bad points. And if you do that on a regular basis, you will see that they will implement this uh, method, this C method, statement, uh, explanation, and uh, uh, well, you state, explain, and exemplify, or illustrate. And this is going to have a major positive impact on the overall quality of their, of their essay. Okay, we learn through examples. We learn by imitating. That's how kids learn. That's how babies learn. They imitate. You do something, they do the same thing. So use examples. If you, if you provide them with examples and if you tell them that's good, that's not good, they will replicate uh, what, what you show them and it's going to be extremely productive. Okay, good. Any question? We are now finished with how to make a point. So this one was a big part of this topic, was a big part of the uh, essay writing workshop because obviously an essay is basically made uh, out of a succession of points. So these are the different ingredients of your essay. So that's why we spent uh, so much time to focus on how we make one individual point uh, and, and because it is 
of course, the major components uh, of your essays. Do you guys have any questions about what we have done so far? Is there anything you would like to add? Yes, Angela, I will add this uh, document on the website because this document has not yet been uploaded. So I'm gonna upload it. Yeah, Professor, and also if you can please upload the document we uh, jointly made before, you know, all the points, the severity and explanation. So it yeah, was a very uh, good thing. You, you, you should have it already. I, I think this one is already uh, uploaded, uh, but I'll check. I'll check, Shweb. And if it's not yeah. uploaded, I will, I will add it. But I think it's already available on the website, but I'll, I'll double check. Yeah. All right. Um, just give me a second. So I see it is already 11.47 and it's okay. We have already done very important points and that's why it, it took us uh, so long let me share this uh, understanding the assessment criteria it's a key aspect of writing a good essay most common mistakes and how to avoid them this was one way to brainstorm and to understand how to give good feedback to your students how to make a point probably one of the most important thing that we had to discuss together during this series of workshop. So you see that, yes, there, there are still many things that we have not yet discussed. I don't think this would be useful to make today's session much longer. We've already met for two hours, 15 minutes. So again, let's just uh, keep this for tomorrow. Uh, and as I said yesterday, if we need to add additional day, one day should be enough, one additional day of workshop, just to make sure that we have covered everything in detail, we will do that. I will add as many days as required to make sure that uh, we have covered the entire content. And of course, this will be uh, free of charge. Uh, okay. So, which means that tomorrow we will uh, focus on these, uh, on these short topics. So you see that there is a lot, but each of them should not take more than uh, 20 minutes. Uh, some of them are a bit longer than others, but others are extremely quick to cover. Uh, so we will look at those uh, various topics tomorrow. I will start by uh, presenting or making a short presentation about each of them. And then I really do hope that you will be uh, as active as possible, that you will share uh, your advices, your experiences uh, to make this workshop as engaging as possible, right? And then we'll just uh, continue with the, uh, the agenda of this series of workshop as planned. All right, is it okay if we stop here for today? Yeah, and Professor, yes. at last, if you, uh, if you please, uh, if you have something in mind regarding the readings or regarding any core resource, just like yesterday, the Curious Economist, like for okay. today or, yeah, do you have All any right. resource in mind where we, where yes. we can always refer um, to? Thank you. I have something, just give me a second. I, I'm, I, I have a PPT with resources. Uh, but, 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 let me find it. When I started making, uh, yeah, when I started delivering those weekly workshops, yes. All right, you should see, you should see my list of resources. All right, so I made the list of resources by type of resources. So there are some YouTube channels that I like very much, and I'm sure many of you you also follow. Uh, those uh, YouTube channels, of course, Khan Academy, Margin Revolution University. Uh, these, are, these are very valuable um, YouTube channels. I love the, the resources and I have learned so much from these resources. A uh, website, um, so yeah, The Curious Economist is, is there. Uh, I, I, like, I like this one very much, Economics Cafe. It's a teacher from Singapore 
I, I believe. Uh, and I really love his content, very detailed, very, very clear. So I think it's extremely useful. Internationally, econ for, any, for anything that has to do with international trade, I also like it very much. Tutor to you, I'm not a big fan, to be honest, uh, but I've listed it because it does cover a lot of content. And well, yeah, you, you have a lot of websites uh, that can be uh, where you can find uh, resources for statistics and data. Okay. Uh, for example, for when you do development economics uh, in A2, uh, these are the websites that I have used in the past to find data, the real world examples, uh, so diagrams, trends. Um, and for PPTs, well, of course, I use uh, for ASNA2 uh, my website. Uh, I don't really use textbooks. Well, of course, I have used textbooks to prepare my PPTs, but then I don't really use them anymore. Uh, for MCQs, well, you still have uh, well uh, my website, which is no longer called Econ Joker, but uh, well, you know, you know where to find it. There is my online dictionary. And of course, they are, you can use social networks. There is the Cambridge WeChat group. I am no longer part of it, but I'm, I'm sure many of you uh, are part of it. And there are many Facebook groups for economics teachers. And I'm very active on the Facebook groups as well, because there are many very knowledgeable teachers with whom to share knowledge. So these are the resources that I have used over the last uh, five years now uh, to well, prepare my lessons and to prepare uh, all the content, the resources that I have developed myself. So that's what I use. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you You're very welcome. much. Professor. You're welcome. All right. So let's uh, let's uh, let's have lunch, right? It's time for lunch now. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. So I I wish everyone a, a lovely day. And again, we meet tomorrow, uh, same place, same time. So nine. Uh, the, the the Zoom ID and uh, password is going to be shared at nine fifteen. We will start at nine thirty, and we will go through this list of topics, how to give valuable feedback to your students, uh, how to implement student peer reviewing, how to format an essay, how to use transition, transitional phrases and, and words, uh, how to support non-native English speakers. You see, there are many topics that really matter and we'll simply look at them one by one, share uh, ideas, share experiences and, and yeah, and then hopefully this is something that's going to help you and your students. Thanks, everyone. Have a lovely day and see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.